World Soccer Verse presents the world history of football. Please click the links available in the written description of this video to jump to specific sections if you wish. Okay then, grab your football boots and let's get going. At the end of part one of this history of English football, we mentioned the attempts by the kings of England to ban what was then known as mob football. Well, these attempts weren't totally successful it seems, as the games continued, even under the bans, well into the 1600s, and even the renowned English poet, playwright, and actor, William Shakespeare, mentioned it seemingly unfavorably in two of his famous poems. Then, in 1618 the game got a bit of a reprieve, when King James I mentioned it favorably in his Book of Sports, even encouraging Christians to play a bit of football every Sunday afternoon, after worship. I should also mention that in the year 1581, the scholar and headmaster, Richard Mulcaster, is noted for having provided the earliest thoughts on the idea of football as a proper team sport. This, while he was headmaster of Merchant Taylor's School in London. He thought that the game could have some positive educational value, as it was a way to promote health and strength among those who played. He also put forth the idea that the game could improve and become more favorable if teams could be limited to a specific number and a referee could be installed for these games. The next specific reference to football was in the 1640s in Winchester, where the game was described as innocent and lawful. A few years after that, Football was not just tolerated at prestigious public schools such as Shrewsbury, Shropshire in Western England. But the pupils were now actually forced to play the game three times a week. Most of the other schools soon followed suit. However, there wasn't a standard set of rules shared by these schools. Instead, each one devised their own set of rules, based on the particular set of circumstances at the school. That means there were different levels of violence allowed, and one school would allow handling of the ball with the hands, while another school's rules of play would only allow for the kicking of the ball. To me, that sounds like the beginnings of the separation of the game into two different sports, those being rugby and football. The two most prominent schools at the time, in terms of football, were Eton and rugby, Eaton being responsible for the early beginnings of the rules of the football game while the rugby school of course, was shaping the rules for the game we now know as, rugby. The rugby school game was known as the running game, while Eaton's game got the name, the dribbling game. Both schools, created sets of official rules for their particular game. Rugby did so in 1845, and Eaton followed a few years later. In 1848. A meeting was convened at Cambridge, in the east of England, to decide on a proper set of rules to govern the game. However, everything was not finalized at that meeting. Eaton made its own rules, for its game a year later, in 1849. Years later, in 1863 another meeting was held in London, to finally formalize, and unify the game. Out of this meeting, the Football Association in England was formed. It is now the oldest football association in the world. Also coming out of that meeting in London was the creation of two codes, one for association football and one for rugby. And a standardized size and weight for the balls of each game was also decided upon. After the association was created, the games continued to develop and improve. It became a great source of entertainment for British workers, with sometimes as much as 30,000 people coming out to see some of the bigger matches in the late 1800s. On November 11, 1871, we had the start of amateur league football in England, with the beginning of the Football Association Challenge Cup. For matches were played that day, at the start of the league, then the very first FA Cup final was held on March 16th, 1872, with Wanderers Football Club gaining a place in history as the first FA Cup winners, having defeated the Royal Engineers football team by one goal to nil at Kennington Oval. 
Later that year, English football was credited with another first. The very first international football game. This game took place on November 30, 1872, when the national teams of England and Scotland went head-to-head -head at the West of Scotland Cricket Club in West Central Scotland. That encounter was played out in front of 4,000 spectators who had each paid one shilling for the opportunity to watch the match, which ended in a nil-all draw. Apparently, the spectators did get their one shilling's worth though, because according to the Aberdeen Journal, the match was the best game ever seen in Scotland. By 1883, there were a total of seven football associations in the area that now comprises the United Kingdom. The English workforce always took this love for the game with them, whenever they went overseas to work, and this led to the introduction of the game to other parts of the world, including countries like those in South America, as well as India. On the Asian continent, with the first such game to take place outside of England, being played in Argentina, in 1867. Notably though, this game didn't involve Argentinian players at all, but was played by teams of English workers. All over the UK, amateur football clubs sprang up. These were oftentimes linked to a company in the industrial towns, or a church, and sometimes these clubs were a reflection of neighborhood loyalties. Many of these clubs built their football grounds among the factories, or the homes, of the workers at these factories, thereby garnering the support of the locals. As with mob football earlier, the rivalry between these different communities could translate into intense competition between the different clubs, from different working-class communities, with matches played out in front of hordes of excited spectators, from each side. The works teams formed during these times included the likes of Manchester United FC, Arsenal FC, West Ham United FC, and Coventry City FC. By the early 1880s, the interest in and love for the game of football had risen to such a level that the clubs began to sell tickets to the matches and players began to receive payment for their efforts. Then, in 1885, professional football became legal, and another three years later, in 1888, the first football league was created. The league's first season ran from the autumn of 1888 to the spring of 1889 and featured 12 teams, 11 of which are still around today. The exception being Accrington Football Club, who placed sixth in that first pro league season in 1888, but was relegated in the 1892-1893 season after losing to Sheffield United. The club then chose to resign from the league, instead of facing the indignity of having to play in the second division. In all of this positive growth though, there remained a vestige of the mob football mentality it seems, at least in the minds of the supporters of these games. This unruly and rowdy mob mentality reared its head at the Scottish Cup final in 1909. The match was played on the 10th of April with the Celtic Football Club and Rangers Football Club, vying for the top spot. That match ended with a 2-2 draw at the full-time whistle, due to an own goal from the Rangers team, and a replay match was announced for the 17th. When the rematch also ended with a 1-1 draw and did not go into extra time, as the crowds expected, the mob mentality took over, among the 60,000 fans present, and carnage ensued. Possibly fueled by rumors about the game being fixed, and not understanding the rules, about extra time, the mob attacked the police, ripped up the pitch, tore down the goalposts, and then set them on fire. Then they turned on the fencing, the pay boxes, and even the turnstiles, burning and destroying them all. When the fire brigade turned up, to put out the fires, they were pelted with bottles and stones, they also had their fire hoses cut up and destroyed as well. We've now come to the end of part two of our look at the history of football. I really hope you liked it and were able to learn something new about the history of the football game. 
please like and subscribe to this World Soccer vs YouTube channel, as we will be bringing you tons of very interesting and informative content covering all aspects of the football game from all around the world. So, have a great day, and see you on our next interesting and informative football video.